All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining United Spinal Association Greater Philadelphia Chapters Monthly Educational Webinar Series. We are very excited to have Diana Fishlock here with us this evening to talk about Pennsylvania's ABLE Savings Program. Diana Fishlock is the PA ABLE Outreach Specialist for Pennsylvania's Treasury Bureau of Consumer Programs. She shares information about the PA ABLE Savings Program throughout the state. Diana's mother and sister worked with individuals with disabilities throughout their careers. So Diana grew up hearing about disability issues and has been passionate about disability topics for many years. Before coming to the Treasury Department, Diana created publications for the Pennsylvania Department of Human Services and covered the disability community as a newspaper reporter. She is also the mom of two teens with disabilities. Welcome, Diana. Thanks. We would also like to thank our sponsors for tonight's webinar, the New Motion Foundation. Their mission is to support people and causes that work towards enhancing the lives of people with disabilities in communities of common interest. Their vision is to engage employees and supporters to donate funds and provide a centralized, coordinated, and compliant gateway for distribution on behalf of New Motion to advocacy groups, policy influencers, and charitable programs. Thank you, New Motion Foundation, for your support. During our webinar, if you are able, please use the chat feature for any questions that you may have, or at the end of the webinar, I will be able to unmute everyone for more of a verbal discussion with Diana regarding any questions, comments, or concerns. Also, at the end of our webinar, I'll be providing two links in the chat box. One is to our YouTube page, where you can view this and all of our other educational webinars, as well as a link for membership if you would like to join United Spinal Association Greater Philadelphia Chapter. I would now like to welcome and introduce Diana Fishlock. Thank you. I was going to try to set up my headphones, but maybe I'll just wait and do that if my teenagers get loud. So let's hope for the best. All right, we'll share screen two. Can you see that okay? Awesome, okay. Oh, did this last time to me too. Bear with me just a sec. It's... Okay, now it's going to work for me. All right, thank you for your patience. Um, I'm very happy to be here tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to get to speak with you. Um, I do have, as she mentioned, I do have two teenagers uh, with disabilities, so we have ABLE accounts at our house, so um, I'm lucky enough to have used ABLE accounts both as a, you know, user and someone who gets to teach people about them, so um, that helps me in my work to be able to talk about them. Um, in tonight's overview, we will talk about what ABLE is, who is eligible, how to open and manage an account, and some additional details and considerations for people receiving supplemental security income. An ABLE account is a savings and investment product for people with disabilities to use for qualified disability-related expenses. One of the most significant features of ABLE accounts is that funds in the account are not counted when determining eligibility for any federal means-tested benefits, with some limitation for supplemental security income. Also, the savings get great federal and state tax advantages. Through ABLE for the first time, many individuals with disabilities can save for a more secure future and have the ability to control their own funds. PA ABLE gives a number of investment options to the person managing the account, 
and funds in an ABLE account can be used for a wide variety of expenses. ABLE stands for Achieving a Better Life Experience. ABLE was signed into federal law in 2014, and that enabled the states to open their own ABLE programs if they wished. Um, Pennsylvania's ABLE program began in April 2017, so ours is almost six years old. Um, Pennsylvania's has been one of the fastest growing ABLE programs in the country with a proven track record. More than 7,300 account owners have saved more than $87 million in assets. So we're very proud of that. As I mentioned, with an ABLE account, you can save while maintaining government benefits. The federal law says that assets in an ABLE account and qualified withdrawals from the account are not counted in determining uh, eligibility for any federal means-tested benefits. Also, PA-ABLE assets are not counted against Pennsylvania needs-based benefits having to do with disability, health, and student financial aid. This is extremely important because without ABLE, it was very limited how much um, individuals with disabilities could save and still receive government benefits. For example, Traditionally, SSI recipients could only save $2,000 in assets without jeopardizing their benefits. Now, in addition to that $2,000, they can save up to $100,000 in an ABLE account, which can make a huge difference, giving a person the ability to save for a house or a car or just everyday expenses. If they go above that $100,000 threshold, SSI benefits will be suspended but not terminated. Medical assistance, excuse me, medical assistance will continue through that time. Able account owners who are not receiving SSI can save more than half a million dollars in an able account. An individual can only have one able account nationwide. And while you may see information from other states, Pennsylvania's able law has several PA specific benefits. These are only available to Pennsylvanians if they use the Pennsylvania ABLE program. Please note that some states' ABLE programs use confusing advertisements and marketing initiatives that may mislead you to believe that they represent Pennsylvania. If you open one of these non-Pennsylvania ABLE accounts, you may be missing out on critical Pennsylvania disability and tax benefits. The way you can um, tell you're in the right place is to look for the PA ABLE logo, which you can see here, uh, it's blue and green, and it looks a little bit like a license plate shape to me. Um, and you can go to paable.gov rather than to another website. So let's talk a little bit about the tax benefits. Um, Contributions to a Pennsylvania ABLE account are eligible for both state and federal tax benefits. <clears throat> Contributions to a Pennsylvania ABLE may be deducted from state taxable income up to $17,000 per person per year. Again, only contributions to the Pennsylvania ABLE qualify to the, for the Pennsylvania state income tax deduction. So um, what that means is um, if I was contributing to my own account, um, I could make that deduction. Or if I was um, contributing to anyone else's um, Pennsylvania ABLE account, <clears throat> including my children, my neighbor, anybody. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, also, there's no state or federal income tax on PA ABLE account earnings while the funds are in the account or when they're withdrawn, as long as they're used for qualified disability expenses. And I'll talk about those in a few minutes. Um, let's look at who's eligible to have an ABLE account. There are two aspects that go into eligibility. The first is the age of onset of the disability, and the second is the disability itself. So the way the law is uh, right now, the onset of the qualifying disability 
must occur before the person's 26th birthday. Um, I am imagining um, some people with spinal problems maybe acquired their disability later. Um, so I have some good news on that. And that is that Congress uh, in December passed a law saying uh, the, it's the Able Age Adjustment Act. And that says that um, beginning in the year 2026, that age will expand. So people whose disability began be, before age 46 will be eligible for an ABLE account. So it doesn't matter what age I am now, and it doesn't matter what age I am, I received my correct diagnosis. I could be 114 years old today, and maybe I received my correct diagnosis at 80. That's fine as long as I had my disability by age 26. Um, the second factor is the disability itself. So if an individual is eligible to receive supplemental security income or social security disability insurance, then they automatically qualify for an ABLE account. Um, there is another option for people who don't have enough work history for SSDI and for people who don't qualify for SSI, and that's called self-certification. With self-certification, in addition to the onset being by age 26, the person with the disability must have a written disability-related diagnosis from a physician who meets Social Security Administration criteria saying that the person has a physical or mental impairment that results in marked and severe functional limitation and is expected to last for at least 12 months. That's because these are really specialized accounts with um, nice tax benefits and um, benefits protections. So they're, it's, they're not eligible to, for just anyone. So my doctor isn't going to say, hey, Diana, you broke your arm, you're a nice person, I think you should have an ABLE account. Um, it is specifically just for people with long-term disabilities. Most people find that the easiest way to open an account is online. You can go to paable.gov and click on enroll. And completing the enrollment process takes about 15 minutes. It's a lot like applying for a checking account or a, a credit card. And I can show you at the end what it looks like to apply online. In Pennsylvania, we also give people the option to fill out a paper application if they're more comfortable with that. You can print that out from our website or you can call our number 855 529 ABLE and request a paper application, which we can mail to your house. Pardon me, there are some unique features on account control and these rules were recently updated. So adults with the legal capacity to enter into a contract um, may open the account themselves or if they want to, they can appoint any other person of their choosing to open and manage the account on their behalf. If the person with the disability is younger than 18 or lacks the legal capacity to enter into a contract, their ABLE account must be opened by another person. Um, and federal regulations um, limit who can be an authorized individual of, of the second category um, to people in this order. Um, these, uh, this hierarchy was recently released by the federal government. Um, so it's in this priority, a person with power of attorney, a legal guardian or conservator, a spouse, a parent, a sibling, a grandparent, or a Social Security Administration uh, representative payee. So if there is um, another person managing the account, whether the person with a disability is an adult or a child, the person with the disability remains the account owner. Um, and the person managing the account is a fiduciary and must administer the funds on behalf of the person with a disability. So just using my kids as an example, um, my son, Ben, um, I administer the account, um, but I am not going to use those funds for myself. I'm not going to take a spa day uh, because it's Ben's money and it's there to benefit Ben. So let's talk about how to contribute to ABLE. 
There's lots of ways to make contributions. Um, you can use a paper check, you can use a money order or an electronic fund transfer. There's lots of flexibility. Uh, an account owner can put money in occasionally or have money put into a PA ABLE account regularly from their payroll or from an existing bank account. So you can um, you can connect it to your payroll. So like every time you get paid, maybe you know fifty dollars or some amount goes in, or you can link it to your bank account, put funds in regularly, 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 or now and then from your bank account. Um, if you um, if you receive SSI or SSDI monthly benefits, you can direct those into your ABLE account as a direct deposit. Um, the only people who can't do that are people with a representative payee. We do ask that each contribution be at least $25, and the federal law limits the amount that can be contributed this year to $17,000, and that's true no matter how many people are making contributions. So let's say um, I had a disability and I had an ABLE account. If I was the only person contributing this year, I personally could put in $17,000. Um, but if, uh, let's say, all of us on tonight's webinar were contributing, we as a group or we as a whole could put in $17,000, not each one of us. Um, anyone at all can contribute to the account. Um, they just need to provide basic information about the account with their um, contribution. Um, two other ways that people can contribute. One is UGIFT. That's a free online service, a little bit like PayPal. Um, and that allows people to um, share a UGIFT code rather than having to share their, their account number to allow others to, um, to contribute. So say it was your birthday and you were having a party. You know me a little bit, but not that well. Um, maybe you say, hey, if you, you know, if you want to give me a gift, um, here's my you gift code. And that allows me to put money in without you having to share personal information like uh, like an account number. So I think that's a nice safety feature myself. Um, also, um, people can roll over a 529 college and career savings account into an ABLE account with um, no tax implications whatsoever which is pretty nice. Um, that does count toward that $17,000 limit. So if I had a 529 college and career fund with say $30,000 in it, I would need to roll that over into my ABLE account over two different years because of that $17,000 cap. The ABLE to Work Act adds some wonderful flexibilities uh, for some account owners who are working. Um, so if I'm employed and I have not made a contribution um, during this tax year to um, three different things, a uh, defined contribution plan like a 401k or an annuity contract or a deferred, co deferred compensation plan, then I may be able to um, contribute more than that $17,000 cap. Um, depending on how much I earn, I could contribute up to $30,590 this year. Um, I'll just leave it at that for, for now. If people are interested in that, I can give you some more detail at the end. Sorry, my computer's giving me messages. Okay. Um, when you make a contribution to PA ABLE, um, you have seven investment options. Six are asset allocation options. And the seventh one is a checking account, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, you can direct your investments to just one of these or any combination up to all seven if you wish. So on this slide, we can see the asset allocation investment options. Um, they range from conservative to aggressive. And um, 
They all have an asset-based fee. They're nice and low. They're less than 1%. Um, they range from 0.3 to 0.33% annually. Um, you can move funds uh, among these options twice in a calendar year, but anytime you put a new contribution in, you can um, distribute it however you like. Oh, you can find out more information about these on our FAQ page, including each account's strategy, objective, and performance over time. Now let's take a look at the checking account. Uh, PA ABLE checking is offered through Fifth Third Bank NA, but account owners enroll in ABLE checking via our website or paper application, just like they would with the other investment options. The checking account is FDIC insured and it comes with a free debit card. Using your card at ATMs is free if you go in network or $2.75 for an out of network machine. The daily ATM limit is $800 and the point of sale, which is what it means if you used it at a store, um, that limit is $5,000 per day, but you can have these lowered if you want by calling Fifth Third Bank. You also can order checks if you want. Um, there's a fee of $6 for 25 checks. There is a $2 per month fee associated with a checking account, but that fee is completely waived if you choose to have your statement sent electronically, or if you have an average monthly balance of $250 or more in the checking account. Also, there's no overdraft or return payment fees. This slide brings the fees together, um, just so we're being transparent. There is um, an account maintenance fee that applies regardless of which investment options you choose. We were able to lower these recently. Um, the fee is $14.50 quarterly if you receive information by mail, and it's lowered to $8.25 quarterly if you choose to receive program materials electronically. And I already mentioned the asset-based fees in the investment portfolios and the checking account fees. Also, um, PA ABLE accounts are free to open. So once you put money in, you'll wanna be able to take money out. Even if you don't have the checking account, you can make a withdrawal from any of the investment options three different ways. You can go online um, and log into your account. You can call us up and say, hey, I need you to send $1,000 to my visa. Um, and we would cut the check and we would mail it to visa. Um, or you could call our dedicated ABLE helpline. Uh, sorry, I just said that one. Or um, you can do it in writing by filling out a form. So if you have a checking account, then you have some added flexibility. In that case, you can withdraw from your checking account by using your debit card at a store, by making an ATM cash withdrawal, or by writing a check if you purchase checks. Let's take a look at what your account can be used for. The quick answer is anything at all. It's your money and you can use it for whatever you want. But if you wanna enjoy the full benefits and protections of the ABLE law, you should use it for qualified disability expenses. The federal law lists the 11 categories shown on this slide, things like education, transportation, prevention and wellness. The IRS also lists basic living expenses. I can tell you with two teenagers, uh, we largely use ours for groceries, um, jeans, sneakers, um, the basic living expenses are biggie for us. Um, the IRS also notes that uh, expenses do not need to be medically necessary, nor do they need to be for the sole benefit of the person with a disability. So for example, um, a computer could be a qualified disability expense, even if other members of the family use that computer. The bottom line is that qualified disability expenses are very broad and they're broadly interpreted. It's up to the account owner to make the decision 
on what is qualified. Um, you don't have to call up the IRS or the Treasury Department and check. Um, but we do encourage you to keep your receipts in case you're ever audited by the IRS. So since it is so broad, you might wonder, why does it matter if it's qualified or not qualified? The first reason is tax consequences. Uh, so remember, we talked at the beginning about any money earned in the account um, isn't subject to state or federal taxes as long as you use it for qualified disability expenses. So if you make a withdrawal and you specify that it's for non-qualified expenses, um, any earnings in that withdrawal, um, the earnings portion of your withdrawal will be taxed at your ordinary federal income tax rate plus 10%. Um, also Pennsylvania income tax is owed on the earnings. So let's say I took out $1,000 let's say $50 of that was money earned in the account, um, I would have to pay tax just on the 50. The second consequence is for federal means-tested benefits. Withdrawals used for non-qualified expenses will be counted in determining eligibility. This is particularly important for SSI recipients. If they make a non-qualified withdrawal and they don't use the money in the same calendar month at that is withdrawn, it can affect their SSI benefits. Now I wanna talk about some of those rules that only apply um, to people receiving SSI. Under normal SSI rules, gifts can impact SSI eligibility. <clears throat> For example, if I received SSI um, and for my birthday, someone gave me a regular, um, someone put a, a check, sorry, my computer's doing weird things. Um, if someone put a check in my regular old bank account, um, I would have to report that to Social Security and it would be counted as income and it may decrease my Social Security benefits. But with ABLE, anyone at all can contribute. And as long as they put the money directly into the ABLE account, it's not counted as income. So um, if, let's say, my mom gave me money for my birthday, rather than handing me a check and telling me to put it in my ABLE account, she would put the money directly into my ABLE account, and then it wouldn't count as income. Um, also, for people receiving SSI, if their account value grows to be greater than $100,000, it will be counted as an asset. In that case, SSI benefits will be suspended but not terminated. They won't have to reapply. Um, and the person would continue to receive medical assistance so they could keep seeing the doctor and receiving their prescriptions um, while they spent down their account to under $100,000. Looks like we're going to get a thunderstorm, so I'm hoping that won't affect our internet connection at all. Um, another important detail for people receiving SSI, housing is a qualified disability expense. However, for people on SSI, they want to pay close attention to timing. Um, if they use the money in the same calendar month that it's taken out, that's no problem. Um, but if, let's say, I take my money out now in March and I pay my landlord um, April 1st, that could affect my SSI benefits because I carried it over from one calendar month into the next. And for SSI purposes, housing expenses are broader than just rent or mortgage. They also include things like sewer fees and garbage removal, um, so you will want to keep this in mind if you receive SSI. So um, this slide is about what happens when an account owner dies. After an account owner dies, all outstanding disability expenses can be paid out by the family. That includes things like medical and burial expenses, legal fees, etc. 
Pennsylvania does not make a claim against a person's ABLE account while that person is alive, but after the person dies, the Pennsylvania Department of Human Services can make a claim under certain, certain, uh, under certain circumstances. Um, and those rules are the same whether or not someone has ABLE. So no one's penalized for having an ABLE account. Um, Pennsylvania is more generous than many states because Pennsylvania limits claims to only funds spent after the person's 55th birthday. So if someone started receiving uh, benefits, say in kindergarten, and they passed away at age 53, the state wouldn't make a claim against their estate even though they were receiving benefits all those years. But if that same person lived to be, say, age 60, the state could make a claim against their estate, but only to seek repayment for services provided after their 55th birthday and only for funds spent for nursing facility services, home and community-based services, and hospital and prescription drug services. That whole process would be delayed if the person was survived by a spouse, a child under 21, or a child of any age if that child had a disability. Okay, so I can show you what it looks like to apply online, uh, to enroll online, um, but let's take a little break here. Um, I can show you that if we have time, but I rather check first and see if people have any questions. Um, also give my voice a little break. Um, so I'm just going to pause here and we'll see if people have any questions. All right, I'm going to keep going unless there's any more questions. We just have one okay. comment, actually. Um, one of the attendees opened up an ABLE account a few months ago and just commented that it was a very easy process. Yay! Well, I'm glad to hear that. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and show you guys what it looks like to apply online then. And then um, I'll stop again after that. And if people have more questions, I'd be happy to answer more questions. And hopefully I won't cut out again. I will try not to. All right, let me get my slides up there. And I need to share my screen again. Screen, okay. Okay, so if you go to our homepage, um, well, first of all, I'll just mention our resources page, which is awesome. Uh, for the resources page, you would, uh, sorry, our outreach page, you'd click on resources and go down to the bottom to outreach. And on that page, um, you can order paper brochures, you can get e-brochures, you can get payroll deduction forms. So, um, you know, in the same way that your employer will put money in a checking account or a savings account or a college savings account or a 401k, every time you get paid, you can also put money in your ABLE account every time you get paid, if you would like to, you don't have to do that. Those forms are on that, um, on that page. Um, also dates of upcoming public webinars. If you have a friend who couldn't attend today, um, they, can, they can find the dates for upcoming webinars there, just loads of good stuff there. Um, so let's talk about how to enroll. So from our homepage, you click on enroll. Um, you can also print out a paper form or um, call us at 855-529-ABLE to get a paper uh, copy if you prefer that. Also, that number is nice if you get stuck on something and you have a question. The people there are very helpful. Oh, I also want to put a plug in for the PA ABLE disclosure statement. Um, that's available online in our enrollment kit, and that contains important information, uh, including objectives, risks, uh, expenses, and restrictions. So you will want to read that, um, you know, before opening an account, just so you are well informed about everything. 
So I'm going to show you um, what it looks like if you open an account online. So first, you're going to put in information about the account owner. So obviously, if I'm opening an account for myself, I'm going to fill out all these. But let's say just for example, if I'm, let's say I have a three-year-old son who has a disability, I'm going to put in his name, his first and last name, but I'm going to put in my email and my phone number because I'm the person who's going to be managing the account. Obviously, if, if we're adults, we put in our own contact information. Now it's asking, hey, who's filling this out tonight? Is it the person with a disability? Is it uh, that person's mom or um, some other person who should be authorized to manage money on their behalf? Depending on how I, op how I answer this question, I may have to um, submit documents uh, like a birth certificate or a court document just to prove that I'm someone who should be authorized to manage money on another person's behalf. Um, now, again, we're going to put in the name of the account owner and their address. Uh, this question is about what kind of disability the person has. Obviously, some people have more than one disability. Um, don't worry, uh, there's no wrong answer to this. Um, it's just the federal government collecting sort of high level data on who it is who opens ABLE accounts. Who is it who needs ABLE? Is it mostly people with say respiratory disorders or psychiatric disorders or autism? Um, again, no wrong answer there. Um, then it's asking us whether we receive SSI or SSDI or whether we're self-certifying. Um, then we're going to put in a state driver's license or state ID, mother's maiden name. Again, it's a lot like applying for a credit card or a, a bank account. Um, I like this page because it's a nice visual representation that I can invest however I want, and I can invest differently every time if I want, as long as everything adds up to 100%. So maybe today I'm putting money in and I want to put all of it in the aggressive option. That's fine. Maybe next month I put money in and I want to mix it up and put a little bit in each of these funds. That's fine too. I also can set this up ahead of time. So if someone else puts money in my account, it'll be invested the way that I that I want it to be invested ahead of time. Um, now it's asking how we would like to fund this account. Do we want to send in a paper check? Do we want to link it to our payroll? So every time we get paid, a certain amount of money goes in. Do we want to link it to a bank account? If so, we have some flexibility there as, as well. If we link it to our bank account, we can put money in regularly if we want to say, I don't know, $100 a quarter, um, but we don't have to have money put in regularly from a bank account. We also can just put money in anytime we want. Uh, we have that flexibility. So some people really like the flexibility of linking a bank account because it's very easy to move money in and out. Um, and some people prefer to um, keep everything separate and that's fine too. There's a lot of flexibility and you can do what feels comfortable to you. Um, then it's asking how you would like to receive information. Would you like to, um, you know, get things online for the lower fees or do you prefer to get information by mail? And these radio buttons um, automate to the, to the choices with the lower fees for you. Then you're going to create a username and password and some security questions about your dog's middle name and where your parents met and that good sort of thing. And uh, that's that's our overview for tonight. Um, again, I put in a plug for the disclosure statement and I'm gonna leave it on this slide in case you want to write down um, the phone number or the email. Um, I have this re relay calls welcome because the last presentation I gave was uh, for a group of uh, individuals who are deaf. Um, so uh, that if you think of a question, you know, in the middle of the night or next week, uh, you know, you will have the contact information 
of where to reach out if you'd like it. So I am going to open it back up to questions.